John Freeman is the editor of Freeman's, a literary annual of new writing. His books include How to Read a Novelist and The Tyranny of Email, as well as Tales of Two Americas, an anthology of inequality in the United States today, and Maps, a collection of poems. John is an award-winning writer and book critic, the former editor of Granta, and one-time president of the National Book Critics Circle. He has written about books for more than 200 publications worldwide, including The New Yorker, The Paris Review, The New York Times, La Repubblica, and La Vanguardia. He, okay, now, does he live in New York? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Now I'm living in London, but basically, yeah, I teach in the fall, so I'll be back there. Because apparently we start teaching in person um, in September. So your institution is, is one of the ones that have decided to do that, or? Yeah, NYU, um, I think because it's in New York and things in New York are very different than they are in the rest of the country, they're going to try to see what happens if we have some form of class in person. I don't think all of the classes will be in person, but there, there will be some component where we're meeting in a space together. So okay. We'll Are you also artist in residence at NYU? Yeah, I mean, it's just basically a title for visiting faculty. Okay. I've been teaching there, I don't know, almost 10 years. And typically I, I teach uh, one class in person in the fall and then I have a low residency class that runs year round where people, they go to Paris in January and June for up to about six weeks. And then in between they correspond with the faculty. I actually like that quite a bit because you, you get very deep into a manuscript when you're corresponding and, you know, in the course of a semester, I'll read about 150 pages. It's almost like the editor's relationship with the writer, I guess, is it? It is, yeah. So for me, um, it's a very natural extension of what I do on a daily basis. Right. I interviewed a, an interesting, because one of my sort of categories that I'm really keen on is author interviewers, which is what I want to talk to you about to some extent. I interviewed Larry Grobel. I don't know if you've heard of him. No. He wrote quite a few of the great uh, Playboy interviews with authors and and movie stars. He he actually <laughs> he got a gig to go to Marlon Brando's island for eight days to interview him. <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> yes. So it was uh, it was interesting. It was interesting to interview him. He wrote a book about about interviewing, so I'm going to quote from that. But to start with, welcome, John, to the Bibliophile. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, we uh, first met in person, I think it's about a dozen years ago at Book Expo. Oh, at least. And at that point, you were the president of the National Book Critics Circle. So that's one role you've played. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit, if you can remember that far back, about that organization and about your role with it. Yeah. Well, the National Book Critics Circle, for those who don't know it, is a member organization of, when I was there, almost about a thousand critics from around the world, but mostly uh, in North America, primarily writing in English. Um, and they basically pay dues to this organization, which at that time, in addition to hosting the annual awards and uh, having events and panels and discussions, was quite active in trying to push back against cutbacks in print book reviews, which was a hot topic at the time because this was before every you know, newspaper in the US, shy, maybe the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, New York Times, Boston Globe, Star Tribune in Minneapolis, and there's a few others that cut their book sections. And at the beginning of the 2000s, there was 200 of these sections, each with an individual editor. A lot of them were standalone too, weren't they? Yeah, there, a number of them anyway. there, there, was, there were at least a dozen of them that were standalone. Yeah. 
And it's, it sounds quaint now, but you know, I think it makes a big difference when there's an individual from an area picking books, assigning to local and, and national freelancers and creating a cultural space that is both specific to that paper, but somehow in conversation with other papers. And I, I learned quite a bit from you know, these 200 or so editors, because I worked with many of them. And they were in Memphis and, and Denver and St. Louis and Columbus, Ohio and Seattle and Missoula, Montana. And the sad thing is between about 2000 or 2003 and 2010, all of those sections were shut down. Most of those people lost their jobs or they were reassigned to other parts of the paper. So when I was active in the book critic circle, I was president 2005 to 2007, we were really trying to raise as much noise and conversation around what, what will happen when these sections go away. And I think there was some technological anxiety at the time about it being replaced to some degree by online discussion. But my p feeling then and my belief now is that there was never going to be a one-to-one -one replacement. In fact, by saying that all that conversation and critical thinking about books would simply move online was a fantasy. The thing that was great about print book reviews is that it was speaking to the unsold reader, <laughs> not someone who thought of themselves as literary or, you know, as a kind of buyer of literary fiction, but someone who just might stumble on a review of, I don't know, a book by Pat Barker. In anecdotal conversations with publishers around America in the last dozen years, they've noticed the huge drop-off in critical reviews and to some degree in sales in, in books that are review driven. So I don't think we can replace that. Although there's, there's been some wonderful additions to literary culture that have been driven by the internet. And among them are conversational podcasts like this one, you know, you, you, you have access to figures or writers and their thoughts like never before, but that to me still doesn't replace the, the, the sort of the broad reach of, newspapers. You are involved in an online uh, publication called Literary Hub. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I believe very much in it. One of the things that um, happened in the mid 2000s was after a, a number of protests that the Book Critic Circle had organized and conversations, I got together the heads of most of the major publishing houses and explain to them what was happening and what would probably happen to their book sales as a result. And said, we need to brainstorm some sort of form of what, what could not replace all of these book sections, but at least um, maybe there's a way to help uh, dr drive ad revenue to the Dallas Morning News or I don't know, the Cleveland Plain Dealer. So the, the argument within those papers that they don't pay their weight because they don't get ads would be um, somewhat neutralized. And Morgan Entrigan came to that um, conversation along with lots of other publishers. And, and about five, six years ago, he said, what if we did this thing where we basically got together all the best writing on the internet in places where maybe they get a thousand viewers a month or 2000 and we put it in one place and it's not gonna replace what we lost in critical discussion, but at least it would make it accessible. And one of the things I'm sure you notice is like, if you have a literary interest, you can, you can go to two or 300 sites on a regular basis and it's, it's sort of endless. And yeah. the, the thinking behind LitHub was to bring all that into one place and also take advantage of the fact that not everyone gets excerpted in the New Yorker or Vanity Fair or the New York Times. And so the vast majority of very good books are not excerpted anywhere. You know, even even short story collections, uh, you know, that, that are coming out, they have a few stories that haven't run. So combining excerpting of, of brand new books with, you know, writing about books, that was the theory behind LitHub and it's been wildly successful. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's had its 100 millionth um, visitor a month or two ago. And on the back of that, they, Morgan and Andy Hunter and a, a few others uh, Dan Sheehan's the editor, started up a site called Bookmarks, the idea behind which was to become a kind of IMDb of books. And the thing that makes me happy about what LitHub and Bookmarks and Crime Reads are doing is that they're drawing very heavily from print-based media. They're not sort of replacing it, distributing it. They're promoting it. 
in a yeah. way. And so every day, about 200,000 people get our newsletter. Each month, it's up to around 5 million unique visitors. And that pretty much makes it the, the mo most widely read site about books in English in the world. And to me, that's, it's one good thing that's come out of this, this period of change. Yeah. So what, a group of publishers put money into it? Eventually, that's, that's part of how it works, is that they're partners who invest in the site in exchange for which they get advertisements. It's not unlike a, just a regular magazine. It's just most of the ads come yeah. from publishing. Although lately, there's more on the site that's not publishing-based, which is a good thing, because when the industry takes a downturn, hopefully we won't be as exposed to, to what the industry is suffering from. But it's not paid content then, because it's not, it's not uh, for example, I put this amount in and you deliver X number of articles or podcasts on my books. It's not like that. It's not paid content. It's just, when you have a book excerpted on LitHub, you get an ad for that book in exchange. And I think people, I see. people yeah. are pretty savvy about, and, and I think uncynical. Like they know that books need to be promoted and they know that running an ad in exchange for uh, part of that book or a piece written by the author seems fair and we choose the books based on quality I mean no one has ever said to us yeah. at least as far as I can tell I've been there five years no one says oh you have to run something on this book and that's, right. even, that's true even of Grove who technically you know are par partial owners of the site without the very official firewall between advertising and editorial that you sometimes you know, would see or hear about with magazines. Um, I think it, it functions responsibly. Otherwise, I wouldn't be there. Yeah. So a big part of the editorial function is to what? To say, okay, these are the, these are the good books. These are the ones we want excerpts from? Yeah, and we have over, I mean, it's probably close to 300 partners. So we're not just pulling from the big five publishing houses. Johnny's the editor-in-chief. I'm there. There's a deputy editor who's on maternity leave. There's a features editor. There's an assistant editor. Uh, and there's an uh, editorial fellow. And that's just on the LitHub side. Uh, and among us, we're all looking at various books, sometimes at the same time, but hopefully uh, as often as possible, different books. Just trying to pick the best books that are out there in as many categories as possible. I mean, we don't cover romance, crime reads does thrillers and crime fiction. Just to try to bring the best that's in a bookstore in excerpted form into, into conversation. And sometimes that's not always an excerpt. You know, like, like in September, we'll have Karen Russell and Sarah Shunlene Bayan, who has a, her first book in 12 years in conversation. It's things like that. Sometimes people write a piece rather than have a part of their book excerpt. Suleiman Adonia, for example, has a novel set in a East African refugee camp, um, not unlike the one that he lived, he, he passed through himself 10 or more years ago. And he's written a piece, um, which we're going to run in September, about picking up languages in, in a refugee camp. And in traditional media, they would have called that sort of off the book page stories. Um, mm -hmm. But the, what I like about LitHub is it acknowledges that there's a kind of field of related interests around a book. You know, the book's not just a, an object or part of cultural capital or something that's trying to be sold. And it's not just a thing in its form, it's a thing made by an individual and a person. You know, a story they don't maybe always want to exploit or, or tell, um, but there are some writers who do want to talk about the personal or individual background story to a book. And LitHub is a place that runs pieces like that, among others. Well, they want to get important ideas out into the, uh, the culture, I, I guess, too, right? Yeah. This week, we have a dialogue between uh, two U.S. Um, Marine veterans of the Iraq War and uh, an academic who focuses on um, military and civilian relations who teaches at Marquette and they're having a discussion about the use of domestic security forces being pulled from homeland security and elsewhere sort of 
to get a, around the military to send quote unquote troops into US cities to uh, protect supposedly historical monuments and, and federal courthouses, but also as a, you know, as we know, kind of show of force and a photo op for the coming election. That's the, right, getting and, top. Yeah, and so the three of them have this really, really wonderful and intense dialogue about what that means. So I'm quite happy that Lithub can be all of those things. You know, it's, it's not just a place where writers are talking about writing and publishing books. It's about the ideas behind them and the ideas that are in our culture. In the last couple months, I've been editing a series called Letters Home by writers from around the country who are kind of thinking aloud about what's happened in the last three months and the you know, several hundred years of U.S. history that's led up to it. Writing some of them actual letters, you know, letters to family members or children or nephews or Tracy K. Smith wrote a letter, an open letter to black Americans. And uh, I think a, a website can be very responsive in creating cultural space uh, that people can think in real time in front of e each other. And I think right now with the massive polarization, some of it driven by technology, and then some of it with much deeper roots within the US political system, those cultural spaces are so important so that people can not come with a kind of preconceived notion of what civic life is or who's entitled to it or who, who should be kicked out of it, but simply to think in real time in front of each other. That to me is what a public space is really for. Well, it's so much better than blasting off a 280 character uh, tirade. Red. I mean, no, there's lots of great things about Twitter, but this is, as you say, a much more uh, thoughtful venue to exchange ideas, I suppose. You know, I, I see some very interesting threads sometimes on Twitter, and I think that would be a, an even better essay, not because it needs to change, but it needs to be expanded. And the hard thing of being an editor in a time when Twitter has such vast reach, is convincing some writers to move beyond that. You know, especially when some of them have followings of 200, 300, 500,000 people. LitHub can reach that many as well, but it's, it's a different enterprise, as you're saying. And I think one of the things I'm concerned about with Twitter, and that made me kind of pull back a little bit from it, is just the feeling that I'm speaking to people who already agree with me. Yeah, an echo chamber, right? Eh? That, that to me is a big problem with American politics is. Well, you're speaking to people who you agree with, but when you don't agree with them, people get pissed off really quickly. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it escalates very, very rapidly. Yeah. I, I you know, I think there's a lot of frustration and uh, I mean, very understandable. I feel it too. Living in America right now, I, I, there's a, a kind of unmovable object that's kind of smashing through norms and in our um, political sphere, which is President Trump. And he appears to be fundamentally corrupt and deeply mendacious and he jubilates in causing pain for many other people. And he seems to be, at least until this election, we'll see, unstoppable. And so that creates this rage and fury. I mean, there are other sources of rage and fury that are being expressed on Twitter. But to me, that's, that's, a, that's a big one because you can't do anything about it. You, just, there's yeah, no I think that, that seems to be the, uh, certainly one of the threads in your book, uh, The Dic Dictionary of the Undoing, that you know, there is, there's apathy, but there's rage. And so, how, so what do you do? Trying to create uh, enlarging spaces is really, to me, what, the way, hopefully, to move around this. And that... That can be a protest or it can be just sort of refocusing on local activities and local groups. I mean, I think this one response to the COVID-19 crisis as people take care of each other, the people around them and, and are limited to the people around them and can't travel you know, nearly to the same degree, people will, I think, discover our priorities have been slightly out of whack I'm mm -hmm. out of whack by this kind of entertainment complex idea of what politics is. Yeah. It's much more rewarding to invest in local, locally. And it's a challenge when working as an editor, because 
in some ways you're always coming in from outside. You know, if you're selling a book or if you're editing a magazine like Freeman's or working on a site like LitHub, all of them are bringing culture to you from somewhere else, even if one or two of the contributors are from where you're from. I've thought a lot about what that means to ex exist in that realm. And it just makes me um, think an editor's job has to be to be as informed as possible. You know, in, in the United States, for example, there was, I think, still is to some degree, an idea that, you know, New York City is the set center of publishing. The last five years, I've, I've traveled to almost every major U.S. city in one form or other for events or research or whatever. And each of them has, you know, with a few exceptions, has a very deep and vibrant literary community all on its own. Mm -hmm. When you say that, I think of Minneapolis. I mean, what a strong independent publishing center that's been over the decades. Yeah, with Coffee House and Grey Wolf and other smaller presses. Um, Milkweed. Yeah, and you know, there are a lot of writers there too. But you can say the same of Buffalo, of uh, Dallas, to some degree Sacramento, where I'm from. Um, they have a great sort of writing group in, in Sacramento. Um, that meet and support each other and what's the point john well i guess what i'm saying is that as an editor is that you have to um you have to be connected to all those places and go and sort of listen to all of them and read into them and read into the context that they're writing out of i don't think you can sort of sit back and just sort of wait for things to kind of wash in your direction if you live or work in some place like New York or London. So for, for example, like D Dennis Smith won the, um, it was either the T.S. Eliot or the um, Forward Prize. I think it was the T.S. Eliot Prize. And to people in Minnesota, Dennis Smith is, is not old news, but Dennis yeah. has been around for a while, has been reading and sort of dis destroying the microphone. <laughs> I was gonna say, I mean, that's his real strength. Quite a reader, I mean, but you know, the, the poems themselves too, when they, the, the best of them have this tentacular energy and, and then unexpected swerves towards tenderness. But anyway, he, that, that's, that's someone that was known locally, but then it took a while for mm. um, that first collection, that first full collection, because Yes, Yes Books did a book before that. But anyway, you know, I'm not saying every city in America has a Dan S. Smith living there, but there are a lot of other writers that are, I was in Buffalo and there's a writer named Eric Gansworth, uh, who's a, a native writer who has written mostly, he's written a, a lot of YA books, some poetry, and he's, he's got a, a memoir and verse coming out in the fall um, called uh, Skin to the, I think it's called Apple to the Core, Apple, or Skin to the Core. And it's just incredible, truly fluid and, and beautiful and funny. And it's a great sort of, Coming, coming of age story. And, you know, in Buffalo, everyone knows Eric. Yeah. So what you're saying then is the role of the editor is, should be much more than just waiting for stuff to come in the door. It should be exploring what's out there. Yes. And that's, that's something that maybe not that many editors do. I don't know. I mean, I know I'm never surprised when I'm in some city in the Midwest or the, in, in the West Coast to hear someone say that they, they had a great dinner with Gary Fiskajon. <laughs> you know, I think there are editors, and there always have been, that leave New York who are suspicious of it. And I think as a Westerner, that's my reaction to it. Well, it's, it's funny, my sense of you over the years is, man, you do a lot, you must do an incredible amount of reading. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, that's the how, do you, how do you do that? I, when I read a book, I have to read it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, so how do, you, how do you familiarize yourself with such a huge range of writers? Do you sleep for like one hour a night or? No, no, it's just, you know, we don't have kids. I, I until recently, spent a lot of time on, you know, trains and, and planes. And so I would read them. And also just work, I, I do work a lot, but I guess I read fast too. Yeah, yeah. And 
I guess you would know what you think is good pretty quickly too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think any editor who spends more than a few years doing it gets a, a pretty good sense of whether something's working for them or not. Other than sort of making sure your tentacles are extended all over the place, what other attribute or activity is the most important for an editor to undertake? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to being as open and curious as possible. Yeah. You know, and, and not solidifying into a, a view. And, you know, you've come across, I'm sure, readers like this, where Mordecai Rickler is, is like everything after someone like that, or, you know, everything after Atwood, you know, she's still working, you know, everyone after Tom McGuane, they, they, they sort of grab onto a, a style or a group of writers and then just follow them to the yeah. end of their careers. And to me, the, the interesting thing of reading is just how endless it is, the endlessness of what writing can sound like and the way that new forms are always kind of folding in on old versions of that form. You know, so like this writer, Edward Louis, who's published a few novels and a memoir in the last couple of years, you know, he's taking the new, Nouvelle Roman and kind of braiding into it aspects of the essay and, and memoir and building off the, the, the work of writers like Annie Arnaud to, to make this kind of new-ish hybrid object, which is both a, a story of the evolution of language, because he's, if you know anything about his life, he grew up in a very small village, the son of a working class man, and, and he was a bit of a drinker, and he was this, told to hate what he was, and he had to totally transform himself to escape in a way, and his whole life has been about not hating what he once was as well, you know, right. the escapist trap. And he's just one example of someone who's grabbed a form that was kind of right in plain sight and kind of updated it. And what I love is just that's happening everywhere all the time and every continent and in and, and more ways than we have time to read. I think um, aside from, you know, just, being endlessly, hopefully, um, seeking the new. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think an editor has yeah, The to new also, and the good. The new and the great. Not all, everything new is good. Um, no, no, I was about to say that, I mean, I find, like, it's very difficult to, to find great writing. Do you find that you're continually being blown away? Or do you find that it's very difficult to find great new writing? I find that if I am lucky, it happens a couple of times a year or something. And sometimes it's something that I know I would like. So for example, this year I read this book by Nikki Finney, who won the National Book Award in Poetry. And I think she won in 2010 for Head Off and Split. And she has this new book that is full of occasional poems, you know, written. We ran one on LitHub um, recently that was written on the occasion of the taking down the Confederate flag in South Carolina about five years ago at the, at, at like maybe a county courthouse or something. But it's, it's also got stories and ephemera and um, it's just mind bogglingly good and it's very different to some degree from her previous. So collection. what makes it, what makes it mind boggling, bogglingly good, John? <laughs> <laughs> A couple of things. One is that it, the way that she writes into public space and debates, and in some cases manages to inhabit the lives of people who are in them. So for example, she has a, a really incredible poem from the voice of someone who was killed in, by Dylan Roof at that uh, church in South Carolina. And she herself, the author Nikki Finney, her father was the first African-American or Black a Supreme Court judge in South Carolina. Uh, so her family history is full of, is, is full of kind of public history as well. And the way the book kind of externalizes that by using photographs and ephemera in between these poems that are in, in and about events that the reader will probably be familiar with. 
it creates an object that feels like life the way that you know, a news event, you know, especially when it is something as violent as, as the Dylan Roof's massacre, it, it doesn't just glaze, it doesn't just glaze your eyes, it, it, you ingest it into your body and it becomes part of this sort of organism that needs to narrativize time and put events like that in the scale of our own lives. So what does it mean to be me living in a world in which this can happen? And those questions are obviously more vital to, to a black poet, let alone a black poet living in South Carolina. But watching her make those adjustments and, and still kind of carry them off events and family history into, I would say, cul-de-sacs of pride or even joy, it, it, it makes the, the, the book feel very interestingly unstable. And, and that it's, it's a, a writer really working hard to make sense of the time and world she lives in, you know, mm -hmm. and a past that she's very, very obviously proud of, mm -hmm. but that also hasn't necessarily protected her or any of the people around her from sort of danger. So that is, that's one thing I read this year where I just thought, wow, this is good. So you could feel it. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a physical feeling. Yeah. That, you know, poetry, especially because it's so much about sonics and language, it's a tr transfer of energy from the mind and body of the writer to the reader. And the best poems, of, you think, I feel like this, I read a D.A. Powell poem or, you know, one of Kay Ryan's skinny little, you know, neutron star poems or when Dennis Smith uncorks one, Terrence Hayes, mm. Marcellus Verme, you know, that you, you feel it in the body. Atwood's next book is poems. Um, and I've read a bunch of those and she has, all these, um, something that, that I, I, I listened to a poet do recently, she has all these rhyming poems about terribly awful things, you know, that, right. that juxtaposition of the sing-song rhyme with the sinister content is, uh, when it's done well, is brilliant. Yeah, well, it's funny, and it's, it's awful, and it's funny, I suppose. Yeah. And it's great, and when, whenever you can kind of get contradictory feelings mixed up like that, and... Uh, that it really does have an impact. I was talking to my uh, friend here yesterday who came by for like a social distancing lunch and we were, we were talking about whether there's a great novel that's not funny. Yeah. Uh, and we, we were sort of struggling. Like I, I, we, the one that everyone picks up on in that kind of co conversation is Wolf. Because Wolf, I, I think Wolf's a great novelist, but I, I wouldn't say that you know, Mrs. Dalloway doesn't really have any comment that I remember. To the lighthouse. Yeah, to, I don't think uh, Madame Bovary's that funny either. <laughs> no, no. But, but I, I love kind of big, noisy, urban, but not, not always have to be urban, funny novels. You know, I, to me that there's so much life in that. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I, it's at the top of my criteria for, for greatness is uh, if I get a bunch of really good laughs, I mean, really, it, 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 entertainment is, is so important and a good laugh is worth, <laughs> is worth a hell of a lot. <laughs> well, it's as rare as, I think, as greatness, we, we were just talking about. I, so I suppose that's what you look for, is a really good laugh, is it? I find that almost always when I find something that really pierces the atmosphere and I think, oh, th this, is, this is fantastic. There's a poet in this anthology I have out just now called Tales of Two Americas about climate, the climate crisis and inequality. And there's a poet, indigenous poet from New Zealand named Taye Tibble. And she had a book, first book called Pocahontas. You know, and it, it's, it's a powerful book. It's a book full of family stories, uh, kind of remythifying New Zealand. But it's also a dirty and funny book. The, the mixture of all those things prevents any of them from being totalizing. You know, that not everything can be made fun of and not everything is, is erotic. <laughs> I love when that happens. I, I, another book I read recently, Louise Erdrich's sister, Hyde Erdrich, is a really great poet. Um, and she's got this book coming out in October, the title of which escapes me, uh, but it's, it's the same kind of vibe. It's um, intensity, a lot of prose poems, and sometimes wildly funny. And it's hard to do. I find it's as 
to be truly funny on a page is very rare. That's, that's why Mordecai Richler is so great in his essays anyway, certainly. I know in his, some of his novels. Yeah. Do you, when you go to France, like you are now, do you, do you read along with your trip? Do you bring, I mean, did you bring anyone with you? Well, I'm about books, as you know, uh, and I love uh, publishers' histories. So I just read a really good biography uh, of Gaston Gallimard. Mm -hmm. And I was overjoyed <laughs> To find out, first of all, that the uh, the uh, the author is still alive, Pierre uh, Asselin, because the book was written in the early 80s. Uh, but second of all, that he speaks English, so I was able to get out. So typically what I do is, if I can get books about books in the country that I'm visiting, then I'm really happy. And then if there's an English-speaking <laughs> component, uh, I'm even happier. But yeah, there's a book uh, a, a couple of years old now, a biography of Jacques Schifrin. He came up with the idea for the uh, Pleiad uh, collection of books that Gallimard now publishes. He's in Paris. So, so that's typically how I, I function is I, I read books that, that I might be able to interview the author in the country that I'm visiting. Yeah. No, I think that makes a huge difference. When I started interviewing authors, I offered a telephone interview. I and hate them. You just, you get very little information from that. You, you do. And it, in fact, you know, when you were actually face to face with someone, there's pheromones or something that, that they're happening, you know, that actually make you feel <laughs> better. Mm -hmm. But also I think there's no question it's a better interview. Yeah, I agree. I, I eventually just, in all but one or two cases, just stopped doing telephone interviews. Yeah. It's hard now because that's all that's really available. Yeah. Well, actually, this is a good segue because I wanted, I wanted to talk to you about how to read a novelist, which is filled with uh, interviews that you've conducted over the years with really a who's who of contemporary authors. And the book is dedicated for my father asked the right questions. So what, what were those questions? I don't remember anything specific, but he was a very big believer in the Socratic dialogue. Um, and so it wasn't so much the questions as the direction of the questions. And the ultimate direction of so much of his questioning was, what do you want to do with yourself? <laughs> when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> what do you want to do with your life? And, you know, I, I think he was frequently encouraging or even directing through his questions me to question assumptions of the world. You know, we lived in Sacramento growing up and I went to a public school and played a lot of sports and there were big kind of marbling veins of, of conservatism <laughs> within that culture. And also just aspects of, I think, even though my dad was a football player and uh, very much of his time, there were aspects of unthinkingness that perhaps would have led to a happier life, but to him led to a, a kind of casual violence of, of Americanness. You know, I'll never forget we were at a, a bus stop, uh, you know, somewhere, and my dad was always a great inter interrupter of strangers. Um, and the, we, we were near an Air Force base that then was, in, was active. And so sometimes you would hear jet engines being fired, testing, or other times the planes would fly over jet fighters really low. So one of them flew over us while we were at this bus stop. And my dad said, without missing a bees, there goes our tax dollars. And then you know, the bus stop rippled because some people agreed with him and some people, uh, but it, you know, for, for him, you know, not questioning the assumptions of any institution or, or, or sort of group was just idiocy. And he also had a great respect, I think, for people who, um, created either art or some, some aspect of culture that served to question culture. He, he was not a believer in reputations. He was a believer yeah. in ideas and yeah. fairness and decency. So those are some of the things I got from him, but always at dinner, almost invariably driving around, he was just asking questions to sort of nudge and needle me. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it's, it's so important, obviously, uh, the, the kind of relationship that you have with one or both of your parents. And I mean, if e either if it's good or bad, or if you've got something to bang up against, especially with your mind, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I really love my parents. My mom's dead, but my dad's alive. And he still is the same way, you know? He always asks questions that cut to the heart of what I'm up to. And he's a great teaser. He must be proud. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, he's a loving but not demonstrative person, if that makes any sense. At this point now, is of course you're going to do what you're going to do with books and literature, um, but are you <laughs> are are you a nice person? Are you not, are you getting arrogant or, or like yourself or like how's your family? You know that kind of stuff is kind of more where his interest goes. But he also is, I think, right now like a lot of people that lived through the '60s and the '70s, extremely agitated about you know the direction of the country. And so when we've talked recently, we, we always end up, you know, on an hour long jag about that because he's never seen something like that, which makes me worried because, he, you know, he, he went to graduate school in the 60s, you know, and was active in civil rights. And so for him to feel like this is way beyond that makes me think, um, you know, the feeling that can happen when it's historic in your own life is like, of course, this is historic. But when you talk to older people who say, no, no, this is really way beyond the crazy stuff that Nixon did. Slightly alarming. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read you a quote from, I mentioned him before we went on air. Uh, he's a, he's a great playboy interviewer from back in, in the day and uh, award winning. He's, he wrote a book about the art of the, called The Art of the Interview. And I just want to run this past you and see if you've got anything to add to it or remarks about it. So again, this is Larry Grobel. You do all the research you can, and it's about interviewing. You look for areas of interest. You aim for originality. You write down questions or topics. You try to keep your questions concise and to the point, and you listen. And what I would add to that is you unleash your curiosity and you try to establish a rapport quickly. So what would you add to that, if anything? Those are great ones. I mean, I used to write down way too many questions. And yeah. in the middle of the interview, one part of my mind would be listening to what they're saying. And yeah. another part would be worrying, how, are we, how am I going to, draw this conversation back to my question. And what the person was saying was far more interesting than my question. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I find doing research really key. The, the most important research, I think, for interviewing a writer is re just reading her books. But then, you know, I think in the past, I used to feel like reading previous interviews was dangerous because it would, it, you would end up asking kind of follow-ups to those interviews. And, and actually what those interviews tell you is not so much what the writer's about, but what type of questions they typically get asked. And, you know, I, I think being aware of that is, is actually quite important, you know. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, sorry, John, in fact, I just did it there. I find that, uh, like I've been accused in a good natured way of interrupting people too often. And typically when I do that, it's because I've heard the answer before because yeah. I've, research their previous interviews and I don't want them saying canned stuff. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I've, I found that uh, one of the best ways to kind of wait out something that someone has said before, you know, in some cases people really think what they think and they're going to just say a version of that. But one way to get around, you know, promotional speak or kind of already prepackaged thought is just to wait, <laughs> is to have a slightly longer interview than or as long an interview as possible because so eventually it starts to drift and sometimes it can drift into interesting areas it doesn't make for an attractive tape no, <laughs> you yeah. have these kind of longers and these sort of cul-de-sacs and then eventually you find your way to, to the topic uh, but back to what you were asking about you know what else would i add to that i think setting and and going to them is quite important going to someone where they live or where they choose to take you 
both of those things tell you something. If they won't let you in their house, I understand people are private. What they, where they take you says something. I think sometimes going for a walk is actually a, a really good in between. I did this with Annie Dillard once, although I stayed at her house. So I, I, <laughs> I was pretty much in the middle of everything I needed to be in the middle of. But no, those are, those are great ones because uh, I, it took me a lot of failure to realize not to um, over-prepare the transcript or prepare it in advance and to listen um, because, you know, all that you need to know is braided into one or two or three answers because you can pull out if you listen in many, many directions. I always want to have a good conversation because my ultimate objective is to make, make it interesting for the listener. But again, the, the question arises, how much of yourself do you put into it? If you're an interviewer, people aren't necessarily going to be interested in you. They're going to be interested in the person that you're interviewing. So where do you draw the line? Some people are so undisclosing that you sometimes have to, to some degree, bully them into disclosure by disclosing yourself. That's uh, right. I, did, I made a fool of myself doing this, and then they'll chip in. Is that it? Out of pity or sympathy, they might <laughs> say, yeah, <laughs> they might tell you something that they wouldn't have otherwise said. Yeah, yeah. Which makes you, as an interviewer, sound like a, a strategist, but you have to be to some degree, because if you're interviewing people that have been interviewed many times, they, they understand you know, what you're in the middle of, that yeah. it's performative in a benign way, you know, and that especially if they're older writers of a certain generation, you know, they have layers to themselves, to their past, and you can't demand everything to be made legible to you, uh, but you can try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. So maybe they say something they haven't before. And, you know, what I was going to say is reading interviews before can prevent you from doing something I did once when I interviewed Toni Morrison. The, the originating assignment was with a paper in South Florida. And my editor said, you know, ask her about the Nobel Prize. And I was like, it was 2004. So she had won. I think she'd been a laureate for about 13 years, which would be like someone from 2007, It'd be like Orhan Pamuk. And I said, okay, all right. I don't think Massachusetts should have come from that. And then the editor said, oh, and ask her about uh, being chosen three times for Oprah. You know, I, didn't, I, I couldn't figure out a way to put this in the interview because it would have it required breaking the kind of third wall of the interview and stepping forward as the interviewer to, to, to use the first person, um, which I didn't want to do in that interview. But I asked her those questions and the first one she answered, she said, you know, it was great. The money's great, but you know, I, I, I didn't think my work didn't deserve it which is a rare double negative for... I was just about to say, I thought maybe you just made an error there, but you... No, that, I'm almost certain that's what she said. Right. Said, but, you know, the money's great, let's move on. And then, yeah. because I was in a hurry to dump this question as quickly as possible, too, and get on with it, I said, so Oprah has chosen you three times for your book club. You know, what, is, what does that mean to you? And she was like, you can do better than that. And then you, you say, it's not my fault. That my editor told me to ask this. Yeah, I, I was very tempted to say that. You know, then I thought, no, he, he asked me and I accepted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The onus is on me. And I just, I felt so bad. And, stupid. Yeah. and I also realized after the fact, what I was asking the most, probably the best writer of the last 50 years in America, and also one of the most dignified writers was to perform her, her gratitude. I didn't do that to John Updike. Like, so you won the Pulitzer three times. How does that feel? So reading previous interviews I think can help prevent you or at least highlight like what people come to writers as expecting from them and that's mm -hmm. going to change what you know based on what they are and what what their background is and the politics of race and gender and mm -hmm. as a as a white interviewer that's something I think uh, you need extra preparation for in a world with those assumptions especially if your world is is you know full of of other people like you, where those assumptions aren't challenged, you know? And, and th this is one thing I, I feel like I learned along the way, you know? Growing up, I read James Baldwin and, and Richard Wright and Zora Neale Hurston. 
but most of my models for white writers were white. And yeah. the way that writing was taught to me was kind of moral lessons, you know, that a, a writer like um, Wright or like Hurston would teach you about racism, which is true. That's part of it. But, they, you know, Hurston also teaches you about language and vernacular and, and, and Wright teaches you about the protest novel and, you know, about close third person. And so to some degree, I think everyone has to, at, at some point, some people more than others, some people more urgently than others, see around the education that they were given and update it. Yeah, some, look into the blind spots. Well, yeah, and, and also, but for, you know, for some people, most of the, the books I read in Sacramento were written by white writers. I didn't think a lot about that when I was a teenager. You know, I thought a lot more about it in college, but my college curricula was far more diverse, partly on purpose, but partly because the school I went to had made a commitment to sort of interrogating sort of places of power within the canon. So that, that, that to me is one aspect of being a literary interviewer that you have to uh, prepare for and see around and, you know, not dominate an, an interview with as well. And, and so not making um, too much of the fact that previous interviewers have maybe approached, whether it's Marlon James, you know, or Maxine Hong Kingston to explain aspects of culture to them. So having an extra long conversation with those writers about that experience reiterates <laughs> the narrowing of the original optic. And so as a interviewer, I think um, one, one kind of Hippocratic oath is probably also not to draw writers or subjects into, you know, debates, which ultimately are endless and not, not debates, but into, into perceptive quicksand like that. Writers can't change the world necessarily that, that sees them. They can't change often the way that they're seen. They can try to write around that and they can also call it out. But to talk as a white interviewer to a writer of color and ask them to comment yet again on how they're perceived is, yeah. is a, I think a waste of time. So what ultimately do you want to get from your interviews? couple of things. I guess I want to get an impression of what that writer's mind is like at work in real time. And speaking is, you know, the closest thing to writing because it's still using language, mm -hmm. it's often narrative based. If it's uh, a poet, they're going to use some terms of phrase that involve sonics and, you know, aspects of poetry. Or if it's a historian, they're going to bring up research that they maybe did or didn't use in a book. And so by talking to someone, you get a very clear idea of what their mind works like. It's not one-to-one -one ratio between their work and their, and their speaking, yeah. but there is a re relationship. So that's one thing. The second thing is just so, to... Just on that, on that one thing, so why do you want to find out how their mind is working? Because as, when you're writing an interview, it's not it's not like a poem or a short story or, you know, it's not something that can sit in a drawer forever and, and not be observed and still be of value. <laughs> you know, it, it's really meant to be um, written for an audience, you know, of people that will read it and be, feel like they too had the chance to sit down and talk to. Okay. So it's, it's to, is to convey what it's like to actually be talking to them. That, yeah. That, that and, is and, and, and more than that, just again, like a, like a great novelist, it's to, it's to enable the reader to embody the character. Yeah, and I also think in an interview, a writer can externalize and say things that their book isn't really meant to say. I find it interesting that, you know, I, I've not interviewed Jam Kotzia, but his, um, uh, I wouldn't call it militant, but his absolutely un unbreaking faith in, in vegetarianism or veganism, the, the, the value of animal rights, really interesting. And that's actually one thing, apparently, if you want to interview him, he'll, he'll talk about. He's, he's not interested in talking about his work. 
I sat down with him and, and got him to sign about 30 of uh, my first editions of his works. But we didn't talk. <laughs> he's, he's a very, very quiet uh, person, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so, sorry, so I interrupted you. This, what was the second uh, sort of ultimate objective? Yeah, so to get them thinking and get the, give, give the reader an, uh, an experience of what it would be like to be there with them. Um, and, the, and the second is to get them to participate to whatever degree they're willing to in situating their work within their life. Increasingly, <clears throat> I feel like it's like creating a miniature biography. You mean getting to know, getting to know them as people? Yeah, but also more than that, I think a life is more than personality. It's a series of, of events that you may or may not have had control over that have created y your way of thinking and your way of being. Yeah, you may have succeeded, you may have failed, and that, that affects your outlook on life too, right? Yeah, and you may have moved, left countries, um, learned new languages, you know, had houses burned down, like Morrison and yeah. Ralph Ellison did as well. Huxley too. It's, it's a strange and alarming number of writer house fires. But I, I think those things all make us slightly readier for reading, to know that something was made by a human life, by a person. I think we, we have so many choices in culture now, and we have so many um, channels that one natural instinct now is to kind of beat it back and Facebook and other social media have helped us along that way by creating like buttons and dislike. And, you know, the, I, the, the ultimate uh, result of this, I think, is, is a kind of cynicism about culture. Mm -hmm. Put novels next to something as vastly funded and multiply created as, a, say, a movie by a major motion picture, picture studio is, is absurd. I mean, even a, even a best-selling novelist like Stephen King, you know, that you could put all the people that work on one of his books in my kitchen, and still he would be doing the vast amount of the work. And so I, I think um, in that environment, something like a profile or, or an interview is an important humanizing element, which isn't to say that all books should be praised or that they're good or books are by nature better than other forms of culture, but just that we need those types of humanizing moments in order in to- In order to uh, what though? In order to- Objects. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, I was talking. <laughs> well, I just think you know, we, need the, we need those kinds of moments along with criticism in order to create a holistically engaging space for books, if that makes sense. Because if, if all you have is criticism, then all, all you're doing is judging literary work by itself. And to me, that's, that's never been quite enough. I want to know who made it, yeah. what the life story is. You know, I know that a biography might be just really high-end gossip. We want that gossip. Well, a lot of them are great too, though. That exactly, gossip is really, really fun. And and uh, so you're saying the role of the uh, interviewer is akin to the role of the biographer. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yeah, you're you're like a sprinter version of the biographer. Okay. Anything else that, that you uh, really want to uh, achieve when you interview people? I think when I started doing this, when I was in my early 20s, um, I wanted them to like me, which was a really bad instinct as an interviewer. You wanted the writer or the audience? or both? Uh, The writer. You know, the audience to me was so far off that it was abstract. But the writer, you know, to some degree, this was a good impulse because it meant that I read all the books. You wanted to impress them. Yeah, but actually, you know, they'll make a judgment pretty quickly. Asking a compli complicated question is not the way t towards it, because then you contort them into smaller and smaller answers. But when I started, that's, that was one of my instincts, and I unlearned it pretty quickly. Now you don't care if they like you or not? I, it's just sort of beside the point. And I think um, the kinds of conversations you can have when that is not, I mean, you, you can be polite and engaged. But when, once that goes out the window, you can, you can have disagreements. Well, and yes. In fact, that brings up a point that I, I bring up every time I interview an author or interviewer. Yeah. And that is the, the old uh, Aesop's fable of the old man 
with the coat uh, and he's gripping it around himself and he's walking along and then the sun and the wind have a bat to see who can get the guy to take his coat off. In other words, do you confront and do you feel comfortable and do you think it makes for a more interesting interview if you confront the author or are you at the other way around where you you think you could probably get more from them if you don't confront them? I'm, I'm a bit of, it's a mixture. Um, I don't produce confrontation. You don't with, come across as a guy that is confrontational. No, no, but in some cases I've asked questions which I know will not be pleasant. I asked Philip Roth about whether he knew he was going to offend um, Jewish readers, and he wrote some of his early work, and was was he ashamed? I had nothing to be ashamed of. And then he went off on an interesting answer. And so I, th- I think dodging those moments is probably not to the um, interviewer's benefit, but producing them also, I think, can create a, a distortion in the conversation. You know, some people are confrontational by nature, and so their interview will be confrontational. Uh, but I don't think writers by, by nature are confrontational, but I think it's worth asking people. I've never, I've never interviewed Mario Vargas Llosa, um, but if I were to, I might ask him about his, his feelings about Catalan as a language within Spain. Um, I might ask him questions about his presidency, uh, run mm-hmm. for the presidency, and they might be perceived as confrontational questions, but I think he's someone that, you know, like Doris Lessing or Margaret Atwood or, Norman Mailer, they're used to being in disagreement with aspects of or people within culture. And so to try to have an interview without any kind of disagreement would, would be a, a mistake. I agree. I, and again, it gets down to, and this is my question to you, what interviews do you find the most interesting? I think it's when there's a, a person who's not frequently interviewed who's connected to a place that I get to go to. And I get to um, see various aspects of their work through conversations with them, but in observation of the place that they're from or living in. For example, I went to Ron Morrow, an island off the coast of Stockholm, where Thomas Tranströmer was partially from. His grandfather had a fishing shack there and he spent his summers there and he, You know, he he had a stroke in the 90s and was aphasic for a long, at least 20 years. So by the time I saw him, he he could say three words, yes, no, and very good, which is kind of two words. That sounds like a good interview. It was amazing. And I brought with me a photographer, a translator who who could translate from Swedish back into English. And there was also his wife who was sitting there kind of interpreting his gestures and facial expressions. And he was very much clearly present. He could play the piano with one hand. He was observing everything. He was flirting in a very benign way with the photographer. It was, it was a great interview because we, all around his cottage were trees and glimpses of the water that kind of bounced off or were directly reminiscent of aspects of his poetry. But my question really though is, sure, and I'm, I totally agree with you, going to the place that they work or they live is is so uh it just is just such a boost it's just that there's so much additional data you know yeah. that you get to absorb but what about the audience and uh, you as a listener or a reader or a watcher of of an interview what what are the most interesting interviews for you as a member of the audience right i guess the I'm trying to think of, uh, mean as a reader or a listener or, or both? Uh, well, that, that kind of, that's my, my next question. And I am winding down here, uh, John. Uh, but, but yeah, that, as a reader or as a listener or as a, a watcher in, in all cases. You made me think of the last sort of really good interview that I read, Hilton Alls' uh, interview of Toni Morrison. And I think a really good interview deepens my perception of the writer and their work and it informs me of their life to a degree that surprises me and you know Hilton Alls' piece was maybe five 
8,000 words. So it, he had space in which to, to work. Uh, but with someone as written about as Toni Morrison, to still do that in a magazine length piece is really great. And so it, I think a really good interview in print or just in written interview restates the case for and re-describes the work of the writer in the context of meeting that writer in a way that elevates and illuminates. And so I think a really good interviewer has to have two things. One is a serious insight into the work of the, of the subject. You know, it can't just be received wisdom. And second, they have to be able to convey that wisdom you know, that insight in ways that are almost on par with the work itself. And so, you know, I'll, you, we've been talking glancingly about biography, but uh, God, what's his name? Uh, Richard Holmes's... Coleridge is great. His, his, his Coleridge books are amazing. And, but his Shelley book is really good too. I mean, he wrote that when he was about 26 or yeah. seven. You know, not only is it really perceptive about the time and the work, but it's, it's just beautifully written. I mean, it's written as if biography is not a secondary art. And yeah. I think the best criticism proceeds from that. I think, I think of um, profile writing and interviewing as a kind of adjunct to criticism. It has the same, same quality of, of intensity and, and aesthetic beauty in the writing. And it's, it's, it, the same thing goes, I think, for you know, a very, very good uh, documentary or radio interview with someone. The questions, the way they're phrased. I was on a BBC program not long ago, Open Book with Mariella Fostrup, one of her last programs before she switched networks. Uh, and it was, I was on there with Tyree Jones, who was a, a book from her uh, backlist was being published in England for the first time. And Mariella's um, intro to Tyree's work and that book in particular was so precise and elegant I just was sort of listening on air and marveling. I just thought that is a really well done intro. And maybe she didn't write it, in which case hats off to the producer who, who did write it. Uh, but I, I think you'll notice with um, the, the really good on air radio program interviews like Terry Gross and Fostrop and, you know, I'm sure you have some in Canada. The, the writing is really good. It, it, it clarifies what someone's kind of about. It doesn't, summarize it clarifies it and i suppose the questioning does the same thing yeah yeah i mean i think ultimately you can begin with kind of open-ended questions but once someone starts speaking that then there's a kind of driving force that happens you know where you can't open up with every question endlessly um, because then you're just basically agreeing that the world is round <laughs> and so that what you the, the very good interviewer, I think, takes something from each question and says, all right, well, if that's the case, let's talk a little bit about this, you know? Yeah, I think, and I'm trying to, I'm not sure if I got his first name right, though. The Swan interview with, with Trump recently, is it Jonathan Swan? Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> it, was, it was great. I mean, his facial expressions were, uh, were as, as good as, <laughs> as anything, but... Uh, but he, uh, the, I think it came up, the fact that he followed up. Yeah. That's where he got the juice, was yes. the follow-ups. And that's what was so refreshing, is no one follows up with Trump. They just let these sort of word turds kind of <laughs> sit there. Yes. Yeah. Just uh, winding, winding up, Talk, if you could, about being the editor of Freeman's, a, a literary annual of new writing. How does that differ from what you did with, uh, with Granta? Not much, actually. It's a similar enterprise, you know, a paperback-sized literary journal. It's just uh, Granta was funded by a billionaire. Um, and this, Swedish? This, or? She's uh, Swedish, um, but she might be a British citizen. But in, in this case, it's... Um, just me and Grove and uh, a few other publishers behind it. The goal here is to, is to create a couple things. When I left Granta, one thing I felt like I pushed as far as I possibly could was what new writers and new sounds could I bring into a, a kind of essentially British magazine without changing fundamentally what the magazine was. 
you know, I think under Bill Buford and Ian Jack, um, the magazine did a brilliant job of kind of finding where new writing was and going in that direction. And, but I think towards the end of Ian's term there, it, it, it became increasingly kind of lugubriously British. Um, <laughs> and the British are that way anyway, so I, I, I don't think they would disagree. And so when I started my... Yeah, but I, they do have the good sense of humor, the black sense of humor that kind of gets the mawkish, mournful stuff. Uh, well, I mean, but it, it, it was beginning to feel like the end of an empire publication. Okay. And, you know, yes, we're at the end of the British Empire and we're at the end of the American Empire probably too, but if the world is only seen through that, those lenses, it's still always returning back to the empire and the centers of the empire rather than finding where interesting things are happening and which whether or not the, the empire center is watching doesn't mean anything to them, writers, literary cultures. And that's to me what I was trying to do when I was there. And, and ultimately, I, I, I feel like um, when I started Freeman's, I wanted to create a magazine that wasn't um, nationally situated. Not, yeah. not American, I can't get away from that. But um, maybe if I put together uh, writers in an interesting combination, the first question wouldn't be where are they from, but rather, you know, what are they up to? What, what do they sound like? And, and yeah, are, are they good? Pretty much. Yeah. And, and so at the beginning it was twice a year and now it's once a year. Cause I, I honestly think um, most people in general have too much to read, you know? Um, and I also in the middle of it started up another anthology series about inequality. And so in the last uh, five years, I've, I've produced uh, I know, about 14 anthologies because I've, I've also edited some anthologies of, for an Italian publisher of American poetry. And I'm, I just finished up an anthology about the Penguin Book of the Modern American Short Story, the last 50 years of the American short story. Wow. So, you know, some of that work is cut into the frequency of Freeman's, but I made the decision to go to one, one a year before I was doing some of that work. But I, I think a, the, wor the world in which, you know, you, you wait kind of by your doorstep, <laughs> You don't wait, but you know that you wait for a publication to come four times a year in the mail is that's a really rarefied world. You know, I, I, I read these descriptions and biographies of Dickens where his journal had 120,000 subscribers. How the, how the fuck did he do that? <laughs> well, those, those would be killer numbers now. I mean, that, that would mean he was five <laughs> times the size of the Paris Review or seven times. Who knows? You know, yeah, well, no wonder he was so damn rich. <laughs> yeah. You, you, did you ever go to the Dickens house in um, in London? You know, it's top of my list. I uh, I haven't made it there th yet, though. I went once because my dad my dad remarried and his wife has family in England and they go over for half the year. And the first time he came over, I was just finishing my job at Granta. <coughs> he said, "I'm arriving on the 23rd." And I said, "Dad, everything's going to be closed." No, 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 it's fine. It'll be fine. And he said, why don't we just like, you know, just see what's open. So he came, nothing was open except for the Dickens house uh -huh. because of the Christmas Carol. <laughs> so we went out there and on the wall in maybe one of his bedrooms is one of his tour schedules from some time in the 19th, the 1800s. And he had, he had like 57 stops in, in, <laughs> in six weeks. I mean, yeah. And it was, this is all by train. And he was doing two venues a day, speaking for an hour, you know, with no notes. And he was um, a, a very unhealthy, like 52 or something at the time. He died at 57, didn't he, or something like that? Yeah, well, I can see why, because he clearly was working himself to, you know, to death. But uh, I, I, I saw that and I thought, what, a, what an insane amount of energy this person must have had. Well, it's funny you should mention that because that's exactly what was going through my mind with you. What an insane amount of energy you must have because you're so productive. I guess, I don't know. I mean, it's nice of you to say that. Maybe, you know, I do have a lot of energy and I have, um, if I'm not working, I get a bit bored pretty quickly. And like I said earlier, I played a lot of sports uh, growing up and you know, not the, not the glamorous sports, although I did play some basketball. Right. There's all the sports where 
you puked afterwards, like track and cross country and swimming. And, and so I, a lot of the sports I played, there was a great deal of physical discomfort involved. And no one, like, there was no one out in the, the stands. Know, there was no one in the stands. To, there was no one in cheerleaders. No, there was no one. There was no one three miles into a cross country race being like, "Good job!" Entirely by yourself. Sometimes I think, like, why did I play those sports? Like, I could have, I could have played baseball up through high school. I could have done other other things. But that's what I did. And I think one thing it it, it certainly put into my sort of muscle memory as a person is just a tolerance for discomfort to some degree, physical discomfort, and a feeling like. Um, that you can, because no one gets great overnight as a cross country runner, you can through a lot of work, end up doing things that, that surprise you. And so for me as a, as a writer, as an interviewer, you know, I don't, I didn't even, I didn't get into Swarthmore's creative writing class. You know, no one was like tapping me on the shoulder being like, you must really write some poems, son. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and in both high school and in college um, and after, I was around people who were like that. None of them are writing now. And so I, I think I was temperamentally created for a world in which you would just spend a lot of time in the second 2.5 mile stretch <laughs> where no one was watching, where you were kind of physically uncomfortable. And yet you, if you don't continue, then it's kind of over. And so that, that's been my saving grace as an ex high school college athlete. It's the long game, the endurance. It is, but I mean, ultimately it becomes about pleasure. You know, like it's not suffering to, re to sit around and read and edit manuscripts. Like, you know, this is what I'm, after we get off the phone, like this is what I'll, I'm working on, a collection of short stories that I'm editing for Grove by this writer, Jaime Cortez. And it takes me a while to edit because I have to kind of in ingest the conceptual project of a book and then slowly kind of read it and not react as if it were mine, but it, it, like react as if I were him. And there's two very different ways to respond to edit and to try to figure out a way to sharpen it without taking away the, the kind of unexpected aspects of it. And, you know, it's, it's an endless pursuit. Just, well, you uh, said earlier on how much there is out there to read. There's all the books and then there's all the stuff online, right? It's overwhelming. Yeah. That's why we need critics. That's why we need the kind of work that you do with Lit Hub. It's, it's to uh, lead us in, the, in a good direction. Yeah, I think, you know, the internet has been a fascinating story of just the, the necessity to some degree of some, some aspects of curating. You know, and curating isn't always, it's not, it's not only seen as a negative. It's not only gatekeeping. It's not always leading out. No, no. no. I like to think of it because this is the way I read and this is the way I, I think temperamentally am as highlighting that which is great, you know? And to me, that's, that's it's what I'm for. It's what I love doing. I love it too. And I love what you're doing, uh, John. Thank you so much for being so productive and for taking the time to tell me about all the roles that you play. It's been, it's been really great. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's, it's sorry we can't now go have a coffee and get yeah. outside one day. John Freeman is the editor of Freeman's A Literary Annual of New Writing. His books include How to Read a Novelist and The Tyranny of Email as well as Tales of Two Americas, an anthology of inequality in the United States today. Now, uh, plus, a, plus a collection of poems called Maps. Is there anything missing on this list? This last year, I, was, I had a busy year. I, I had a new collection of poems called The Park. And uh, the last of those inequality books just came out last week called uh, Tales of Two Planets, uh, which is a it's 35 writers from about 30 countries writing about inequality and the climate crisis where they are. 